Okay, now uh, we, Ann is uh, heading up the uh, program committee and she arranged for a group from the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community, LGBTQ, I never can remember that, <laughs> say it exactly right, to come and talk to us. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their self. It's on meetup, but just what you wanna say. So y'all, we got chairs for you sure. up here and. Randy, you get to go first. I know you the best. <laughs> I know Randy through several uh, events that she's hosted. Uh, the one training that I did, uh, oh, the group of ladies that came uh, about four, three or four years ago at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, anyway, that was a really good event. They uh, talked to us about being more aware of other uh, cultures and other people's uh, thoughts when we're out just wandering around in the community. So it was a really good event. But anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to Randy and let her go from here. Okay, so my name is Randy Romo and I am the co-founder and the current director of the Center for Artistic Revolution, also known as CAR. Our name kind of scares people. Um, but for us, we were a bunch of uh, artists that were activists. Uh, my co-founder, we're both Latinas, and we wanted to do something that was out of the cookie cutter box of a lot of organizations that serve LGBTQ people are known as Equality, Arkansas, Equality Texas, Equality Vermont. And we saw that those organizations had more of a set kind of demographic that wasn't really as, uh, we didn't feel was as open and affirming to multiple communities as we felt like we should be. And so we started CAR with that premise that we wanted to create change, but we wanted to do it creatively. We didn't want to just sit around and talk at people. And we wanted to figure out how to use the creative process of art and spoken word and uh, theater, et cetera, as a means of conveying messaging as well as talking to each other. Um, so with that, we started about 10 years ago. We are currently housed in the First Presbyterian Church in Little Rock. And um, I think it, it, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting that as we are expanding across the state, we are being housed in other churches across the state when religious institutions have traditionally been uh, very difficult for many of us. But we are finding allies in many of these churches in the, in the state. Myself, I do not identify as a Christian. I follow more traditional indigenous belief of my people. But um, we think it's really great that we do see these institutions that are helping to serve our needs and give us a place to be. Because we are in the First Presbyterian Church and they don't charge us, we have the first and only drop-in center for LGBTQ youth in the, in the state of Arkansas. Well, this feels like it's all country. And uh, <laughs> it was culture shock when I moved here. Boy, let me tell you. Um, and we have an adult community center and we are a staffed organization and this is what we do, working for LGBTQ equality, but we also work from an intersection of oppression analysis. You know, that we believe that various racism, sexism, et cetera, classism, these things all contribute to each other's ability to maintain their power and impact to disenfranchise multiple communities. And so it's kind of like it's working on the 99 and the one is, you know, rocking it along, making sure that it keeps functioning. So we work with our community of LGBTQ people to address their own issues in these particular areas within the community. Because it's, it's kind of like um, all gay people don't know each other and we don't all have the same perspective when we come out into the world as being LGBTQ. Uh, you are the product of the culture you're raised in. So if you're an LGBTQ person that was raised in a very racist household, you may carry those uh, thoughts and processes with you despite the fact that you yourself are struggling with access to equal treatment. So we, we see our work as being uh, uh, a work of reciprocity. That while we are trying to educate and work with and organize to have our allies help us to move forward in our, in our quest for equality, um, at the same time, we are doing the work inside to make sure that our folks 
are increasing their capacity and understanding about what it means to be a good ally. Because, you know, you, if you want good allies, you got to be a good ally. And so in our, in our, our primary programs that we're working right now is uh, Diverse Youth for Social Change, which is called DISC. And Xavier here is, is one of our members. He's been with us for a little over a year. And Xavier's parents are uh, our PFLAG mom and dads. So we have the parents and friends of lesbian ladies. <coughs> and that's a national program that we house the Little Rock chapter in our, in our space. And we partner with them a great deal. And um, our current DISC program has about 300 members that are LGBTQ identified youth or ally youth. We have a lot of straight ally kids that love the program. Our program is designed to be a social justice slash life skills. And um, we can't run them off. So, you know, we've, we've, I've had parents come in that were talking that were, their kids were not gay, but there were some issues in the home, they're struggling with the kids, and they were there for a completely different reason. And, and they mentioned the thing going on with their child, and they were like, well, I wish I had a group like this to, to take, I said, bring them. You know, any child that's willing to come in the door and be, be open to inclusivity and, and fair treatment of each other and respect and love and caring, they're welcome. And so we have this amazing group that are allies and LGBTQ, and we, we can't run them off. Every Friday night we have anywhere from 20 to 35 kids in the building. And we've since opened a chapter in Conway that is for the youth program, um, and it's housed in an Episcopal church over there. And we've just recently opened a full car chapter up in Fayetteville that uh, will house all the programs that we have in Little Rock. Another big part of the work that we do is a Safe Schools Initiative, and that was an organic emergence from the youth program, because we hear what's happening to our kids in the schools, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about that here in a minute. Um, we think it's really important. We have an anti-bullying law, and the last legislative session it was enumerated to include LGBTQ community, community members, but there's no enforcement. And as we educate in the school systems, and there's no mandate that we, they have to let us, so we have to really beg, plead, and, and just beat at the doors until it took us three years to train in Cabot. And people said we would never get there, but we finally did, and it was amazing. Um, one of the things we find out across the board is that school counselors in their preparatory to be counselors in schools have nothing in their education process that prepares them to deal with the LGBTQ students in their, in their schools. And more and more of these students are coming out in middle school. Some of them are even thinking about their identity in grade school. And so um, we think that it's really important that those that have our kids for the greater part of the day uh, have an awareness and an understanding of what these kids are going through. Also, we know that in many cases, the administration and the educators are contributing to instances of bullying or ignoring it and what's happening to our kids. And when we, when we talk about Saber Schools, we also talk about what it means for all the kids that are being bullied for whatever reason, that across the board, this is unacceptable. But in particular, we focus on LGBTQ because nobody is talking about this population in the school systems. So those are two of our primary programs. Then we have GEAR, Gender Equality Arkansas. And Andre here on the end is uh, one of our main facilitators for that program. And this is a program for our transgender, gender queer, gender variant, people that don't fit the pink and blue box that say, you know, gender is this to me. And this gives them a safe space to be, to talk about it, to have support to uh, be mentors to other folks. And we think it's a really important program and we're really proud to have this be a piece of our work. We're also very big on advocacy and organizing in addition to all of our education work. And we currently are a member of the Arkansas Citizens First Congress, which is housed at the Arkansas Public Policy Panel. And the Congress is uh, comprised of 54 grassroots organizations from across the state and it's made up of very uh, diverse communities. We have Latinos, we have African Americans from the Delta, we have uh, two LGBTQ groups there, Stonewall Democrats and ourselves. There are um, environmental groups, there are uh, groups that focus on economics. So it's, it's a very diverse group of people com coming together to look at what they feel are important issues for the, the betterment and the well-being of the state of Arkansas and its citizenry. And so um, one of the things that our organization has put forward on multiple occasions in the Congress, because we vote on a slate of what we're going to work on in the legislative session every year. And so we have put forward a Civil Rights Commission for the state of Arkansas because we believe that this is an important entity. 
we're only one of three states in the nation that don't have one. It used to be only two, two states, but Oklahoma recently dismantled theirs. No big surprise um, if you look at the trends in Oklahoma. Um, but we feel that it isn't important because there isn't one and we're only one of three states. We feel it's important because civil and human rights violations uh, are happening across the state to multiple communities. It's not just to LGBTQ, it's not just to African Americans. It's happening across the state to multiple communities that their rights are being violated routinely because we have a civil rights law. It does not include LGBTQ at this time. That would be one of our advocacy points that we intend to see changed. And um, it has no enforcement. Uh, 11 years ago, a U.S. Commission on Civil Rights was convened with the Arkansas Civil Rights Commission. And the recommendation was that a Civil Rights Commission did need to be established in the state of Arkansas, and it did need to include LGBTQ people. They gutted LGBT, LGBTQ people from it, they took it to the legislature, and it didn't pass. And 11 years later, just last week, we had another convening of the Civil Rights Commission, once again asking, do we have a need? And it's kind of redundant. So we told them the same thing they were told 11 years ago, yes. And um, so we felt, we felt that there was some, some significant movement, though, because of our work in the Citizens First Congress. We have been working to move diverse groups who didn't necessarily think that LGBTQ people should be included in the, in the issue of civil rights. You know, in the South, there's an ownership on that term. And uh, there's a, a difficulty in, in getting people to shift from their perspectives that are usually based in religious um, uh, principles. So because we've been in the Congress for about six years now, we have slowly but surely begun to shift that. And so I was really proud that when we had this testimony that all of our allies in the testimony that they were giving about their particular community, be it the immigrant Latino community, be it um, uh, for the Marshallese, uh, be it for African Americans, people were including in their testimony the need to include LGBTQ Arkansans. So um, we're really pleased to see that, and this is going to be a significant part of our work in the legislative session. And so that's, that's kind of a, a quick one-two on what we're doing, so I don't want to take all the time. So this is Latricia West. She is one of the volunteers with our organization. And so she's going to tell you a little bit about her experience from the Rainbow. Uh, my name's Latricia West, like she said. Um, I have been working with CAR recently. I feel like I always wanted to kind of uh, stand out and be a part of something bigger. I work in a field where I meet a lot of people all day long and uh, I'm a one-on-one -on -one per type of person, but I wanted to get into something where I could uh, reach more people. I always thought I was a big communicator and I think that uh, a lack of communication is a downfall in our society. And I'm all about bridging gaps and uh, showing that we're more alike than we are different. And we have, if we focus more on our similarities, uh, the differences won't matter so much. So I fancy myself a free thinker too. And uh, I'm just here to answer any questions that you all may have. Um, hi, I'm Xavier. Um, I'm a youth member of DISC at CAR, and I'm also a member of Citizens First Congress. I'm glad to be here. Hi. Can you talk a little bit about your school experience? My school experience? Um, I, I came out um, as a member of the LGBTQ community in my seventh Third year at Plaza Heights Middle School here in Little Rock, and almost almost immediately afterwards, um, I received physical and verbal abuse from teachers and students. I I was purposely smashed into a locker, just trying to get me to pass out. I've had things written about me on the lock lockers, on bathroom walls. I was tr someone tried to put me in a trash can once. Um, because of all of my experiences at the middle school and now high school level, I've had to transfer out into a home school. Hi, I'm Andrea Zekas. Um, 
as uh, Randy said, I, um, I facilitate uh, uh, gear meetings, which is our gender, um, a very transgender group over at CAR. And um, about a year ago, I attended a, a, a panel just like this, where I was in the audience with you, and um, it was an LGBT panel, panel. And one of the questions that was, that was brought up was, is like, you were looking at the panel, and there was not anyone on the panel who was transgender. And someone asked, it's like, why is there not a transgender panel a person on, on the panel? And and one of the respondents said, it's like, well, uh, transgender people don't necessarily have a voice here in Arkansas. And so when I took, I heard that, I kind of said, it's like, this is something that I can do. And so I stepped forth and wanted to do more of that now, which is why I do the facilitating, which is why I help individuals who are in the process of transitioning, because it's a difficult process uh, where where um, a, a gay or a lesbian or a bisexual um, a person who identifies that way has to, has to deal with having to, uh, it's almost like a statement to, to them, a person who's going through, who's going through a process of becoming, trend, of, of doing this, have to physically change themselves. They might have to, they might have to get ostracized for um, having to make these changes in their lives just to be the person who they want to be. And, uh, I've met with people who have lost family members, who've uh, lost their jobs. Um, in some ways, the transgender community is almost a microcosm of a lot of little things that were of, of all the issues that are in society. And they have one more thing on top of it is that that they have a hard time of having acceptance from from other people. And uh, so, I personally um, have. I was was for, was was very fortunate where I still have my family. My family loves me. I had I kept my job after I transitioned, and I um, was able to keep a lot of things. A lot of my all of my friends I kept. I did lose a bit of professional connection. Um, where I had one time I'd been a journalist, and um, there was a television station in town who refuses me refuses more than one time were very welcoming of me coming into their newsroom. Uh, will refuse to let me enter a newsroom now, and they they meet me off to the side, like in little private meetings. So I'm not, not not necessarily invited back to go see them anymore. And so my background as a journalist is kind of like over. But now I, I do other work, and uh, I work with I work in I work as a state employee, and my experience has been wonderful. And I think that there's a, a need to. If you have things very fortunate, and it's very, it's, I'm very fortunate, and I feel like I want to, why, if it, if it happens for me, how come it can't help happen for somebody else? And so that's why I feel like there's a, my importance is to, is to give, to pay it forward, to help people through the process, and to um, be a mentor. And that's it. Oh, I, 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 I forget. Channel or? <laughs> 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 uh, that so oh. <laughs> well, we'll say that um, the media sometimes has a difficult time about how to look at transgender people. I will say that um, we've we certainly had a, a story up in northwest Arkansas, uh, northeast Arkansas, where they had um, uh, portrayed, where they had reported a story about a person who had shoplifted at a, at a Target store and labeled the person as a cross-dressing man, a cross-dressing shoplifter. And they and they never really went ahead and, the police sometimes don't know how to classify because, oh, the person had not gone through any, the person might be on, on hormones or may not be on hormones or don't know what that person's gender identity is or don't know what gender identity actually means. But, um, so we did not, they never really find out whether that person is a cross-dresser or whether that person really is a transgendered woman. And nothing has ever gone further than that on that. And so, and part of my issue with the story was that like, do we really report on shoplifters that often? <laughs> it seems pretty, it was- Yeah, like, with a photo. With, with a photo, and so it was mainly out there for, to uh, exploit that in, in, in an individual. The Jerry Springer effect. Right. <coughs> He's got a lot to answer for. Right. And so, and so, 
and we've had issues here in Little Rock where they would report someone as, as a transgender man, and that is not necessarily who is and actually is a transgender woman. And so, for a community that for for a media, we're we're, we're going to have more people who are becoming out as transgender. We're going to see more. They say it's happening more often, and they're coming out as younger. And yet we have media who doesn't necessarily know how to report on us and treat us fairly within the media. And, uh, and I found that from my newsroom or from other newsrooms, and um, sometimes that's from the news directors or the editorial staff. But it's just that you're supposed to be, as a journalist, to be out there and to know your people, know who you're reporting on, understand completely. Um, to if you have if you're concerned about something you don't know whether you're saying the right thing is to ask questions and to do the research and um, I'm sad to say that journalists in these days is kind of kind of kind of sloppy that uh, we don't check multiple resources we don't ask people and I think that's another and we're getting sources from people that from from police departments without necessarily getting background from other we're not doing the research. So. And, and I would I would say to you add to that um, one of the difficulties because organizationally we do media education around this particular topic, but um, Arkansas is a market where people come in to get their next step to the next station in a bigger market. You know we're a pass through, so the media personnel are changing constantly. So we'll get a newsroom to where we think we're good, and then four or five of the main people that we think we're good with have gone on to a larger market. So that, that, that constant turnover creates a real dilemma for us since this is very real. Journalists are not thinking about how they're reporting these stories. We had an incident um, about a year and a half ago in the Forest City where a young trans woman was shot in the face, drug run back and forth with a car, and we had two problems there. We couldn't get the sheriff to even agree that that's possibly a hate crime. You know, when you shoot somebody in the face and run them over multiple times with a car, it couldn't be a hate crime. The media immediately began, man in a dress found on the road dead. And so we did a huge education campaign across the state and, and even into, into Tennessee where, uh, where this, because it was up near, uh, it was four cities that's up near that way. And um, the markets there were just being really Jerry Springer. And, and we had this great conversation. We thought we had, every, even in that area where the shoplifter was, we thought we had it all down and, and people were much better educated. We'd take the materials, we met with them. And they even began to report much more uh, appropriately. You know, it's like, okay, if you can't bring yourself to use a female pronoun, just don't use a male one. You know, just, just be ambiguous. Uh, you know, because you don't know how this family felt, and they may have been okay that their child was transgender, and you're really putting more hurt on the child, its surviving family, when, when you report this sensationalistic stuff, and it's just disrespectful. But with the, the changing of the market, with the people moving into larger markets for their career, it makes it really difficult for us if the, if the core newsroom won't hold their staff accountable for this kind of reporting. So, yeah, it, it's a tough. Good journalism is supposed to inflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. And uh, I, I, you're supposed to do no harm. And I think that it does, they do, they do it the service by um, picking on people who really have very little to stand on in some ways of, I mean, I mean, these are people who don't necessarily have a voice and yet they're going to target them with, with the reporting. And uh, it's kind of disturbing as someone who has, I mean, I have a master's degree from a prestigious journalism, from, from, from a J school. And I have been through, I've been a producer in Billings, Montana, and Sioux City, Iowa, and here in Little Rock. And I was going to be one of those people who moved down to another place, and um, I can't get into a newsroom now. So it just seems this is kind of lonely. Okay, so. Uh, Question for Andrea. Okay. Uh, how old were you when you first thought about changing gender, and what kinds of influences has helped or hurt you in your decision? Well, I think for myself and most people, I think we were aware of things at a very early age. And I think part of it, I think the reason why things are happening 
now more often. I think a lot of people know at an earlier age what's, what's going on. But it's that there are more people around them that are, they, they, have, they have the internet to look at, they have friends they look at, it's more of a topic, a conversation, and they feel more comfortable, they can look at things and say like, oh, this is what I've been dealing with. It's not necessarily that that is telling them, oh, well, I, I'm going to be transparent, but it's like that they've, there is more voices out there now than there was when I was a child to say that I can connect with that, and I think that's wonderful. Um, and between, always between like, you know, around three or five years old, people, are, you know, boys or girls are kind of like the same. They're trying to get, sometimes they're, they're exploring genders in different ways, but when that, if that goes, it doesn't, if that continues on, then it's usually seen that the person that might be dealing with a gender identity issue. And um, I didn't make my transition until I was 30. And that's when I was 30 is when I met my first, when I originally met my first transgender person face to face. And I knew that, oh, you're going through the same thing I'm going through. When I was dealing in, when I was in high school, and thinking that, what are these feelings I'm having, and how come, is there anyone else out there like me? That, that wasn't there. We didn't see other people like us, and now we are able to see other people like us. And I think that's wonderful now. And it's gonna be a continuing trend. It's very like in the AIDS community, the, as more people come out, more people are right, more people feel involved to come out. Um, a lot of people in the closet for a lot of reasons. And mainly it has to do with, uh, in the Bible Belt, where you have ignorance, bigotry, um, prejudice, and hypocrisy. We're all dealing with that in one level or another. And I grew up in Chicago area. <laughs> so I mean, I think it's, uh, I think sometimes we, we sometimes are around people who are almost like ourselves or we have groups that are almost like ourselves. And um, my parents raised me very, very well. I had a very happy childhood. But nothing really stuck out to me. It's just like, oh, this is so terribly, something's so terribly off. It was that, that my, my parents loved me. And I think they did a really good job raising me. And uh, I think sometimes for some people, when some things are kind of jarring to them, it's like, my parents never really stuck a, a G.I. Joe in front of my face and said, I have to play with that, <laughs> you know? I had a very gender neutral childhood, and so it never really was a thing. But I think for some people, when they see those things in front of us, it's like, whoa, why do I not want this? It was, it was never an issue in my family, but for some families, it is an issue because, you know, boys are supposed to be tough, and, you know, and to reinforce those gender roles. And so it never really happened for me. Age. I have a question for Xavier, and I would like to know more about how your peers talk to you and treat you, um, if, if you feel like everybody treats you differently or if you feel like they're just isolated pockets of people or what, what the overall sensation, what the overall feeling is you get from, from your classmates? From the majority of my classmates, I have a feeling of disgust almost sometimes. They just avoid me most of the time. There's quite a few. There's only a few people that come directly towards me these days. But overall, it's just to discuss, and they just want to stay as far away from me as they can. Are there other kids at your school who also identify? Um, not or as many as I wish. Um. Majority of my friends that I have that are a member of this go to a different school here in Little Rock that is much more accepting. My best friend just transferred over there. Um, the only other person was one of my friends from Hosky Heights, and they're now homeschooled. I have a great deal of respect for Xavier because I had an experience. I've always known that I like girls or was a lesbian, but. I grew up in a very religious household. We went to the church every Sunday, every Wednesday. We read the Bible, we prayed before everything. And, and that was just something you weren't supposed to do. So at home, I never expressed that as a child. Um, when I was in elementary school, actually, there was a situation where me and this girl, we, you know, kind of were caught doing something. I was so many names and I denied it and I denied it and I cried and I blamed it all on her. It was her, she did it, she did it. And that experience was like at 
I was probably around eight, nine years old, and I was horrified. I kept it in for so long, years and years and years. That's why I have such a great deal of admiration for the uh, kids from this and people who are who feel uh, strong enough to come out at an early age. That's why I believe that it's real important to uh, have these groups in as, much, as little as elementary school because when you know, you know. And if you have someone who's encouraging you to be yourself, you're more likely to do so. I didn't have anybody around me that was gay or lesbian. I didn't know anybody who was gay or lesbian, so uh, I was in the closet for most of my life. I ended up getting married when I was 18 years old because I thought that was what I was supposed to do. I thought that it would, you know, please my family. Turns out when I did come out, my family was like, okay, if that's what you're happy with, that's what you're happy with. <laughs> and so I think it's so important that the younger you are just to, you know, have those outlets to get you to know yourself more because you never know. I mean, you can have a bad experience like Xavier, uh, but you don't have to. Um, and you did, if you don't ever, you know, come out, you never know what the, uh, what the outcome will be. You know, I spent a lot of years of my life being somebody I wasn't because of what I thought people would think about me. And it doesn't have to be so bad. There are so many cases just like Xavier's. But like I said, I was one of the lucky ones and I didn't have to live a life for years and years and years. I didn't have to because I had a lot of people who still loved and supported me regardless of what the situation is. I have nieces now that are uh, five, four, and two, and they know that TG likes girls. I want them to know because I don't want them to be the girls that called me a, a dyke when I was, you know, eight years old. I want them to know that it's okay if two girls kiss each other, it's okay if two boys kiss each other, it's okay if, you know, whatever you like to do, it's okay to let people be themselves. And, uh, yeah, that's why I appreciate you guys being open to learning more about this. Yeah, one of, one of the things that um, I think is really phenomenal about our group of youth and young adults is um, no matter how bad it is through the week, they know that, that they have that support either through their Facebook or they can call myself or call the program coordinator, Kat, and eventually they'll be able to call Latricia because she's in training to, to be a disc wrangler. <laughs> yes, they are wranglers. Um, and, and we think that, that it has a profound impact that we're not advocating that you come to DISC and be gay. We're not advocating that you come to CAR and be gay. What we're advocating is that you know, you be able to, to live your life with full dignity and value and to be safe and to know that it's okay to be exactly who you are. You know, when we, when we scrape off the, 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 the prejudicial stuff that's mainly religious backed, uh, we all want the same things. We, we want living wage jobs. You know, it, it offends me deeply the amount of money that's poured into anti-LGBTQ causes when we have children that are hungry and schools are having to make their students bring toilet paper because there's not enough money in the school budget. I mean, to me, that, I think that what I believe the Supreme Being to be is greatly and mightily offended that uh, people use, use that as, as the base of oppressing other people. Because, you know, we, we all want to take care of our families. And LGBTQ people in Arkansas and in much of the United States do not have the legal rights that most people that opt for forming families have. I mean, even families that are unmarried, they're, they're discriminated against as well. Heterosexual couples, you know, face a, a, an inordinate amount of discrimination because they choose not to marry. But whether we choose to marry or not, there should be basic fundamental rights around living wage jobs and health care and education and resources for families. You know, when we talk, when, when Jerry Cox led that whole adoption ballot for, what, that went on for 10, 11 years, they poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into keeping kids that don't have enough homes available to them now from being in a home with a same-sex couple, which was ridiculous. I mean, when you think about how these kids get in the system, it's not gay parents that are putting them there. You know? I, like, it was like such a bomb. You know? And we didn't see Jerry Cox and his crew running out and adopting them and fostering them either. You know, they made this great big platform about what terrible families we are, and it just seemed to me they weren't living by their own, their own uh, mission. That, you know, 
they're supposed to be. And then we had one, one summer, four kids died in the care of the supposed perfect you know, families. You know, families are families across the board. Some of us are more screwed up than others. When my family, when my parents got divorced, we celebrated. <laughs> thank you. You know, love them both, but oh dear God, thank you for getting a divorce. Um, you know, the, fa the value of family is the care, the consideration, the thought, and the intent and the love that you put into that relationship with the people under your roof. That's what makes a family. You know, not our sexual orientation, not our birth genitalia. You know, it's who we are as people and how we treat the people around us. And so that's what we're looking for here in Arkansas. I mean, CAR exists to support those who are, you know, suffering from the infliction of, of biased law and religion, but also to empower and grow folks. Like our youth program, people are like, oh, that's so great that you have a support group. I'm like, whoa, 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 DISC is not a support group. If a kid comes in and they're like, oh, my life sucks, I'm gay, everybody hates me, we're like, yes, and we're gonna work on that. We're gonna help you feel better about that. Now, let me talk to you about how you're an advocate. How do you organize? How do you educate? So at the same time that we're supporting them and helping them to feel empowered and stronger and know that they're in a loving, caring, safe environment, we're teaching them to be advocates for their own lives, their communities, their schools, and not just about their issue. When uh, we did the first legislative lunch for LGBTQ youth at the legislature a couple sessions ago, and Joyce Elliott had brought the DREAM Act forward, which being a Latina, having undocumented members of my family, they're such not anymore, but at the time they were. Uh, being Mexican American, you know, these issues are, are very close to us, and with our intersectional analysis, you know, we really get it, and folks that are not Latina in our organization get it. And so our youth had been learning about this issue, about, you know, uh, these kids coming to the states when they're three, four years old, graduating from high school, and then bam, they have to pay double tuition. And their families are usually very low income. So the kids were like, well, we think we should support this, so we want to work on this issue. So we're like, okay, so we get them all ready. Well, they're in the cafeteria doing their little lunch thing where the legislators, you know, are going to come in, legislators going to come in and sit down with them. Jenny Burlesworth of Secure Arkansas, which is a very, very, very rapidly anti-immigrant organization. And, and our group, the, the demographics shift. Sometimes it's pretty white, sometimes it's pretty even, sometimes it's more the other way. You know, it just depends on who's coming and going. This particular um, manifestation of the group was pretty white. And she sees this little group of little white kids sitting at the table, she trots over there with her tray. And Gina, one of, uh, one of our original uh, facilitators, she comes and gets me and says, Romo, you got to see this. <laughs> She's trying to recruit them to secure Arkansas and to embrace her anti-immigrant sentiment. And they just, bam, they just took her to school. Everything she said, they were, and they were very respectful but they spanked her hard. <laughs> and I'm just standing back there in the door laughing because I mean, I was never more proud of a bunch of gay kids in my life because they got it, that their issues are really important, but what happens to other people around them is important. And they got it that other kids need the opportunity to learn and have an education at a reasonable uh, point of access. She took her little tray and she left. <laughs> and that was an amazing thing and, and that's what we do. With, with our young folks, and we think that that program is one of the most important things that we're doing, as well as trying to reach out in the schools. You know, like I was saying earlier about the school counselors, um, that's kind of important to me that, that these guys are getting out into the system and don't know anything in, in order to work respectfully and, and appropriately with their LGBTQ students. Um, a lot of times, uh, Johnny doesn't have any resources at home because he hears the conversation across the table that mom and dad are having from the day's news, et cetera. He has a pretty good idea how mom and dad are going to come down on, on gay, you know. And he may see things that are extraordinarily homophobic from his school administration, et cetera. So where does this kid have to be safe? And so uh, we're really pleased that Dr. Catherine Crisp over at Euler in the Department of uh, Social Work, she makes it mandatory that all of her class of uh, uh, future counselors have to have our training on LGBTQ. And, uh, and she also does a separate one on transgender because the whole topic of transgender is its own conversation. 
you know, we really tried, uh, we actually had a gay male that was supposed to be on the panel, but he had a, a death in his family and, and couldn't be with us. Because we really want people to understand that, yeah, it's an alphabet and we run it all together, but we all have different issues. Even though we're all under that big rainbow umbrella, there's different points of impact in the way that prejudice and bias works. But the bottom line is that no matter what people think about us from their church, and I really don't care, you know, I, you don't have to marry me. I won't go to your church. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with you thinking gay people are going to go to hell. If that's your, your rhetoric, go for it. But what I'm not cool with and what I think most of us should not be cool with, and I kind of get a feeling this group probably doesn't think it's okay, to inflict those values on our civil rights laws and what our governance does. You know, all of us, when we fill out our tax forms, there is no box to check, discount. Gay, trans, you know, gender queer. We don't get to check off a box for a discount on our taxes, but you by golly better believe they're going to come jump on us if we don't give them that money. That's kind of like the most un-American thing I ever heard of, if you think about the principles of how that and religious freedom, please. You know, they cite that as being our founding principle. Well, I think they left off a line that, that probably was implied, but they've conveniently forgot it, that we should have the right to be free from religion. You know, this group should not be ostracized because you don't believe in a sentient being or, or whatever your values are. You know, we have the right to think the way that we want to think. We don't have the right to hurt other people with our thinking, but we have the right to think it. So I think that goes right back to the, to the Christian principles, et cetera, of those that would use religious doctrine to oppress any of us. And I think that's why it's really important for those of us that believe that justice doesn't mean just us. <laughs> that's good. Run into that a lot. <laughs> I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a school teacher for the Ross School District, and I just want to say we've had our group has had trouble with uh, Jerry Cox too, or encounters with him. But anyway, uh, I'm also a gay man. Um, and Welcome. I, <laughs> we have a secret <laughs> salute. <laughs> 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 I go to a lot of workshops, and there's a lady who does a lot of the workshops. A couple of years ago, I went, and uh, first of all, she ignored the whole gay issue with, with bullying. Uh, and then she ended by saying, if everyone just believed the Christian values, then we wouldn't have this problem. So I raised my hand, and I said, or other religious values, or human values, and so she, uh, she got to know me as, as someone that, you know, she kind of watched what she said when I was in there. <laughs> so I went to another workshop, and um, she, at the Little Rock School District has passed a, uh, that kind of did under the table, kind of very quiet, low, yeah, very quiet, that uh, gay and lesbian and transgender were things you can't discriminate against. So she made the statement that, well, now we have to, you know, she's talking to the teachers, now we have to, um, not discriminated against gays and lesbians, and she went on and on. She said, and uh, if you, uh, if, if so, if someone chooses this, and so I raised my hand again, <laughs> it's not a choice. You know, you can only choose. You can't choose your sexual orientation. You can choose whether or not to hide it. So anyway, she she keeps moderating her program as this. <laughs> she came to my school and she walked in. She saw me and she kept it very. <laughs> she didn't make say anything that you know, I could raise my hand. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, um, Little Rock School District actually had us come in and train all of their principals. And they gave us a letter of recommendation for the training afterwards, recommending that other school districts, because our goal is to eventually have the state make them take our training. You know, do what you will with it, but you need to hear it. And uh, in the elementary yes, section, the princi one principal was sitting up there, I don't know why we have to be in here. And I was really happy to see three of the lady principals go, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, son, you're ground zero. You know, they're calling people faggot on your school ground right now. 
They may not know what it means, but they're using it as a slur. I said, and you, I guarantee you, have same-sex parented families. You have kids that are probably already recognizing that they may be in the rainbow. And I said, and if you don't, I said, you let a kid walk by you and use the N-word in your hallway? Well, of course not. I said, do you use the same uh, disciplinary measures if somebody uses uh, faggot or dyke or queer, or et cetera? And he's like, oh, we will be. And, and at the end of the training, he came back and he said, you know what? I get it now why we needed to have this training, because it's pretty in-depth, and we're really pleased with And it's a kind of living document. We, we, we keep tweaking it as you know, we get the feedback from our participants. But we think it does two things. Well, first we start off with you know, trying to get them to empathize, emphasize, emphasize, empathize with the situation. And a lot of people will move right there, the way we construct the exercises. Some don't. So then we talk about laws, because there are some laws in Title IX and, and other areas that we're able to, to get some of these cases done. Um, and then you'll still have two or three in the back that are kind of like, when we talk about the largest lawsuit today cost them $900,000, and they go, oh, they sit up, you know. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not on my watch am I going to allow this to happen. And then the other thing that we feel that happens is because uniformly in our audiences that we train, and this is at all professional levels, because we don't just train uh, in, within the school system, we also train, we finally have cracked the door to working with more counseling uh, organizations, counselors, that are not necessarily just uh, educational counselors. And uh, one of the things that we have found to be universal in our trainings is when we talk about their client or Johnny and what they're gonna face if they're able to stay in the school system, because the reality is is that we have a, a school to prison pipeline and everybody thinks, well, that just hits youth of color. LGBTQ youth are pushed into that pipeline right along. And if they're an LGBTQ youth that is youth of color, and particularly if they don't present gender norm, they're at the head of the line to be pushed out of school. So we really impress upon them that, you know, if the child survives school and has any reasonable value of education because just because you're able to sit there every day doesn't mean you're going to get a quality education because you're too freaking scared about what's going to happen when you leave the door. It does not constitute a great learning environment if you're in a constant state of fear. Plus you skip, you don't come to school because you're afraid. So let's say Johnny gets through all of that. Then Johnny has to face the reality that he can be denied employment, he can be fired from his employment, he can be denied housing if it's not HUD or a HUD loan, because uh, the feds have made that where uh, sexual orientation is now included in, in uh, gender identity. But if it's not HUD, and a lot of housing in Arkansas is not HUD housing, you face those discriminations. You face the discrimination of uh, holding your boyfriend's hand at McDonald's, and you say, hey, we don't have that here. And public accommodations, if you look at the American with Disabilities Act, and there's a big list of what public accommodations, it, it's cited specifically there. It's a huge list of doctors, libraries, shopping malls, just about any place you want to go and have your life, LGBTQ people can be legally denied access because we are not included in civil rights laws. But most Arkansans do not understand this. And, and you'll just, because when we talk about what little Johnny's going to face, they go, Oh, but there's civil rights laws for that. And they're like, yeah, unless you're little Johnny and, and out as a gay male. We are not included in the civil rights laws. And they just like are aghast. So people get it. If we can get the conversation away from gay marriage, because, you know, uh, marriage is an important issue to a lot of people, but the right to work, you know, the right to have housing, and the right to go into the places that you want to go affect far more LGBTQ people than the, than the issue of marriage. And there's such an ownership of marriage, kind of like civil rights, that it kind of derails the conversation. So for us, we talk about the issues of work and, and public accommodation access and housing and being able to protect your family, insurance, uh, credit access, inheritance issues. All of these things are, are pretty important to the family structure whether you choose marriage or not. Because there's a lot of LGBTQ people that will not marry. They will not enter into what they feel has been an oppressive institution for whatever reason. So we think it's really important that the educational piece we do with the safe schools is we do feel like it's having an impact, but we know there's a lot more work to be done. 
but we also believe that we are helping to shift that movable middle that may not necessarily have a line so hard in the sand and simply didn't know because their ears are ringing with the rhetoric. Uh, they don't even understand the things that they do care and think that everybody should have access to regardless of your sexual orientation or your gender identity. Um, I've got a question for you, although I do want to thank all oh. of you for coming for your various uh, opinions and experiences. Sure. But, um, and I wrote it down without texting, I promise, because uh, <laughs> I tend to forget things. Um, but uh, as a gay man, I see there's plenty of subcultures within the gay community. I see it especially that gay men and lesbian women tend to not really associate um, for various reasons. But, uh, I'm still with that. Uh, Specifically for you, how do you kind of circumnavigate transphobia that comes from both the straight community and the gay communities? Because I, I see plenty of transphobia within, especially my gay male friends. Oh yeah, and even I find that um, it's interesting. I think that coming out as a trans woman is a, it's it's jarring to some people because I think that um, um, that. There is there is a more of a, an appreciation of different varieties of how to be a woman within the the, the, the female and the lesbian community. There's there's a greater breadth of that, but sometimes I know for, for generations, and even the feminist movement at one point had an issue with that, with them, um, with how can these people who identify themselves who were originally men, how can they become women, and how can um, and even within with among men. That there seems to be a very, very not as wide of a, of a various of how that form of of, uh, of gender can be expressed within that community. I know that even within like um, I, I'm very familiar with one. I used to identify myself as gay, and I'm very familiar at one point that um, uh, that there are people who say that within the gay community that it's like, oh, I, if you're straight acting, I'll go out with you. But if you're not, then I don't want to associate with you. And so there's, there seems to not only not just an just issue with just um, this person is going to be identified as a woman, but how is the person really expressing their gender in some way. And um, uh, that's some of it. <laughs> um, but I found out that well, let's let's talk about my 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 my, my, my workplace. Um, I am right now the only transgender person who is out at where I work. There used to be two of us. <laughs> now I'm the only one. Um, I work amongst amongst a, a bunch of group of women. Uh, they see that I am not coming in there to be the um, to throw a rainbow flag in front of their face and to be this 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 somewhat this drag queen stereotype. Which really does kind of, you know, you know, we are trying to be who we are. We're trying to be women. I did not, I did not go through this process to become a drag queen. I didn't come through this process to become this characterization of woman. I came to be this person who identify who myself as is. And if I knew in my heart that I was a woman, I should be seen as a woman. And when I first came out at work, it was kind of like, oh, this person's going to use the bathroom. You know, there's someone in there who has got a penis <laughs> in the women's restroom. You know, and management was like, you know what, you're in there doing your business. I know what so many people are doing there anyway. You know, this, you know, if, if this person leaves and comes back, you know, should that be a problem? And so my, they, they says like, as long as she comes presenting as a woman and lives her life as a woman, she has the right to use the women's restroom. And they did make accommodations where they said they were to put like little like um, like something to close those seams in the door to make it seem like that I couldn't look at me and and Tom or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's how it worked, and 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 for and it was amazing to me to see that there were some men and some women who came out and they said that uh, that they were supportive, and yet I have some men who refuse to talk to me still to this day. And uh, over time, 
what I found out was after I had surgery and after I, they, they keyed in on the idea that, oh, this person had surgery, that the, the, the attitudes changed. I have more women coming up and talking to me because like, hey, she took this seriously. She knew what she was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, if I come to work every single day and I'm not changing who I am, I've, you know, I'm not changing anything else. It's like, what does it take for me to prove to myself that I do that and you do that? But then you realize, that, well, it's like you have no one to prove it to. That regardless, you're in people who are going to say one thing or another thing about you. You just need to go ahead and have that. And I think what's great is that my my workplace set in its guidelines. It says like, this is the this is how you're going to interact with this person. This is the rules of how this is the rules of combat. You know, this is how this is this is how things are going to work out. And reasons I see why some people have issues in workplaces is that some people that it's not necessarily guided from the top down. People don't say it's like, oh, this is how we're going to. This is, this is how it's going to work. You know, I have friends who work at other workplaces that they only have one bathroom they can use. They can't use other bathrooms. I have, you know, I've known people who've gotten released from jobs for being transgender. So, um, and within the within the LGBT community, I will I will say that there are times when. It's kind of unfair, and I think it might be said for larger organizations that way that um, that sometimes transgender issues are sometimes put on the table, and they're brought back because they're in, they're not palatable. That it's like, okay, we will deal with your lesbian and gay issues, but we want to touch the transgender issues. Or we would throw the transgender out there, and it's just like, well, it's a bargaining chip. And I was very happy that um, I've never felt like a bargaining chip with Carr. I think Carr has um, great respect for what we can do. What that what we can do as 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 a group because you know really the transgender community is a whole wide swath of of people. I kind of I kind of described it at one point in another talk I gave. It's like it's like the uh, we're a Big Ten. We're like the Democratic Party, and we get all together. And we don't necessarily have sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's confusing what we're all talking about, but we all like each other in some ways. And so, um, but um, the. I have had cases where I felt like that my issues were being dismissed because they find that our issues are much more difficult. It's like, well, we're going to handle the things we can handle first. You might be like 10 or 15 years down the road. And it's been said that transgender um, equality is maybe about maybe 10 years behind what gay and lesbian have, are in some ways. I mean, we're seeing now more on TV, more people who are transgender coming out, we're seeing uh, people on TV who represent us, you know, celebrities, things like that. I think a couple years ago, I think uh, one of the, it says that the transgender is like the, like the, the it's, it's, it's the trend thing, you know? <laughs> it's fashionable to be transgender, and that's yeah, not, it, I don't, you know, it's like, great, this is my life, you know? <laughs> but, um, and it's, it's fascinating because when you look back at the Stonewall, it's it was it was transgender people who stood up first and said we need we can't take this anymore. We need to go do something about it. And sometimes it's the people who we go through these processes in these lives, our lives, that we can't do anything else. We're at our wit's end. We have to do something about it. And uh, so I've known that my issue sometimes with I've I've, I've ran into people from larger organizations who have, have dismissed my my, my what I have to say sometimes because I'm transgender, but I know that what I have to say is important. And, and as a caveat to that, I would say that our office gets about four to five calls a month from transgender Arkansans that are dealing with issues. And the number one issue that they bring that they are having struggle with in their life is the bathroom. And this contributes to you know serious <laughs> urinary difficulties because people hold it because they're so afraid to go to a bathroom because they're not sure what's going to happen or if they're going to lose their job or if they push to go to the appropriate bathroom. And so a lot of times they just choose not to go to the bathroom, which is not good for any of us. And, you know, you wouldn't think that something as simple as emptying your bladder would be such an issue. Yet. But this is one of, one of the big issues that we hear about constantly at CAR is they won't let me use the appropriate bathroom or they're sending me across the street and docking me 
because it takes me 20 minutes to go from here to drive over to where the building that I can use the bathroom. In some ways that's uh, shades of Jim Crow. Oh yeah. yeah. Separate facilities for blacks and whites and oh well we just have to put in, you know, one, you know, six facilities for whites and one for blacks in this in this town. And uh, well, you know, it's just too bad. And, and I think this goes back to what you were saying with uh, in our, within our community, the Michigan Women's Festival has always been on my bucket list. And this is like the premium lesbian, queer women's music festival. Anybody that's anybody in music is at this festival. It's like a cultural thing. It's huge. And they came out being very, very transphobic. That preoperative trans women could not attend the festival. <coughs> now, yeah. my brother is a sister. I have five biological brothers, but one's a sister, and is preoperative, and is more woman than my mom, certainly more woman than me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I told mom, I said, see, you know, we're 10 months apart. I said, that's what happens when y'all didn't have cable back then. <laughs> um, but because she can't go and my other trans sisters cannot attend Michigan, I will not attend it until they change, if they ever change. So I may never get to go to Michigan. Well, are they going to check her underwear or something? I mean, how are they going to even know? You have That's, to register as a transgender? If you appear to be a, a trans woman, they will ask you if you're post-operative. Well, how, how do they? And not everybody, not everybody, everybody don't passes. appear to be anything but other than women. But there's a lot that don't pass. And right. so mm -hmm. there are some women that have attended that were able to pass. And it's kind of gotten to be this, you know, subversive, like, I'm going to sneak right in there. Um, because they know they're women. Yeah. But then you have people that are just so freaked out because there's a penis in the, in the room. Um, and it's like, wow, you know, what about modicums of, you know, behavior? And anybody can be an asshole right. whether they have a penis or not. You know, I've seen drunk lesbians be really offensive to other lesbians, you know, in an inappropriate sexual way. But we're going to worry about the trans woman. And I've, and I've been to music festivals in the past where I have seen people that have uh, overindulged and been extraordinarily inappropriate sexually with, with other lesbians. I'm like, hey, this, that's more likely to happen than what you're worried about over here. <laughs> but yes, we do see this kind of bias in our community, but there are a lot of us that really, really oppose it and work for full inclusion. This is a fascinating discussion. Thanks very much for coming. I was disturbed to hear Xavier's story and, and coming from a school that I expect to be at least more accepting than some uh, in Arkansas. So we hear more and more about the bullying, but it doesn't seem to be getting any better. There, don't, there that doesn't seem to be enough people standing up and saying no. So, uh, Xavier or the rest of you, any comments about that? What do you think makes it better? Or they can do to make it better? Besides send me up there. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really talk about bullying at all. They, um, they classify bullying as um, beating someone up, and that's typically not the case at school. It's traditionally verbal in most Slurox schools that I've attended or had friends at. And every time we have a meeting in the auditorium, all they talk about is horseplay hitting each other. They don't really ever touch on bullying or they ignore the LGBTQ community if they do. Yeah, it's kind of like our sex education the schools that do have it, because Arkansas is primarily a uh, um, abstinence. Um, but the schools that do have uh, sex ed, ed um, they do not include sexual minority youth, which is our LGBTQ youth. And what we have found, GLSEN um, released their 2011 National Climate Survey, which surveys, uh, I think it's close to 8,000 students on the, that are LGBTQ on their experiences in the school. And what they have found is that the bullying is decreasing nationally, but it's incremental. And it was so high to start with, it's still not in a good place. But what they have found, and this is something that CAR does, 
is that schools that have gay-straight alliances have a much lower incidence of bullying against LGBTQ students because these gay-straight alliances give them a place to have peer support. They're not alone. Uh, kids know that there are other kids that they can talk to and there is a sponsor who is an adult that is on their side. And so CAR as the national um, uh, Arkansas affiliate for the GSA network, um, there are 34, soon to be 35 GSAs in the state. When I came here a little over 10 years ago, there were none that were functioning. So we see this as being an important part of our mission is to do everything that we can to increase uh, the safety of our uh, youth and young adults on the school campuses. Well, there, I believe if, uh, a lot of people who look at kids, young kids, and think, oh, okay, they should know about this stuff this, you know, this early on. But I volunteered at my former elementary school uh, a year or so ago, and I was in my in the second grade class, and I saw a, a little boy call a little girl a faggot. Now that makes absolutely no sense, but he doesn't know that. All he knows is that faggot is a bad word, and I'm going to call it, you know, to to this little girl. And there was a teacher's aide in the class, and she and went on about her business. And she ignored it. She didn't didn't say anything about it. Didn't acknowledge it. And I think um, if they start with the teachers and give them a little sensitive sensitivity training, then once they see it, they'll be able to, you know, do something about it. But I don't know if a lot of them actually want to. I think that, you know, they're perpetuating their beliefs and thoughts onto these kids and they're making them think that it's okay. Because if he knows that he can say it in front of a teacher and nobody cares, he's going to do it again. And who's to say, even though that little girl, obviously, in the fact, who's, you know, a gay boy, or uh, who's to say there isn't an actual gay boy in the classroom who overhears it and sees that teacher smirk at it and, you know, that just beats him more down, down into his cubbyhole, kind of like I was. It's almost like it's my. Even though I always felt I was a lesbian, it was so suppressed because it was just, you know, down, down deep into a little ball because I didn't think that I could, I didn't think it was gonna be okay with anybody. And the younger that they know it's okay, the better it will be going forward. If you gotta teach them in first grade, teach them in first grade. You know, if this one's gonna take, this one's gonna take. I teach, I teach elementary and uh, that's the biggest thing that kids call another kid that call them gay. They don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. So I, when children's story, uh, I've had several kids come to me say, so and so call me gay. And my response is, did you say thank you? <laughs> <laughs> so I start telling all the people in history who were gay or lesbian. And, and I had several kids go back and say to the kid, thank you. <laughs> I, I, had, I had a little kid, I, I did a summer program, an arts thing uh, a few years ago. and. These little peanut heads like this big, you know, first graders. And we had them at the big tables and we were working on this big collage project. And so I'm sitting there with a few of them. The little boy looks at the little boy across to him and goes, you a dyke. <laughs> and the little boy's like, yeah, sucker, you a dyke. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I said, OK, first of all, he can't be a dyke. I said, I'm a dyke. <laughs> Does he look like me? <laughs> and he's like, no. <laughs> I said, dykes are girls, first of all. Secondly, dykes are proud, fierce, warrior, amazing women. He goes, oh. <laughs> and that was it. And we just went on. <laughs> but I bet you he didn't, call, he didn't call anybody else a dyke after that. But I think you had a... Uh, Trisha, you mentioned you're raised religious. Mm -hmm. Are you still? <laughs> I consider myself more spiritual. I believe there is a higher being, but as I grew up, the things that they believed in, they just weren't what I believed in anymore. I, I was in the same church since I was five years old. I got married at 18 in that same church. Everybody thought that was okay. And uh, when I did come out, I tried to go back to the church because I got out of the church while I was kind of finding myself and I tried to go back because I thought that was the thing to do. Uh, even still knowing that how they felt about us, I thought that, you know, this is my church family. They've known me since I was a child. They've, I've spent the night at these people's house. You know, they've watched me grow up. 
And for me to go in that church, and I have a group of my, it was about five of us, gays and lesbians. <coughs> and they just so happened to do the sermon on how gay people are evil, and uh, how we're sick, and how we need to be prayed for, and things like that. That was about the last time I went to that church. <laughs> if it wasn't for my grandma, I probably would never, ever, but you know, she brought us up there, and you can't say no to my grandma. She's one of those types, but I never brought any friends back. If I do force myself to go, I sit in the bag and try not to talk to anybody. But they know, they know, so they don't really talk to me much either. But it, it just hurt to know that these people who I, who basically helped raise me, a lot of the values I have come from them, but the fact that they can't accept me knowing, knowing that this is just a small part of me. I'm still the Latricia that they helped raise, but this is a small part of me won't let them accept me. It was. I was like, okay, well, too bad, uh, y'all's loss, you know, and I moved forward anyway. And we're glad to have her. <laughs> <laughs> she come to the church of car. <laughs> Getting back to the, the early education for children, they are certainly taught at the very early age to hate and fear and discriminate based on their parents' um, beliefs. And I think there, I think we can't start too early teaching them tolerance and common courtesy and basic human rights. So um, it seems that if if we have a problem um, such as um, a birth defect or a health issue or something or or any sort of thing that affects our entire life, we're all very happy when someone gets that corrected or is able to live with it and be uh, be relatively normal unless it's related to gender and sexual orientation and in that case the hatred and fear uh, and condemnation uh, for some reason it's acceptable in that community and, uh, and that's that's a very intransigent problem uh, that religion feeds constantly but I think I, I'm pretty sure that Jesus is on record for tolerance, uh, and I don't know how they can get, they can contort their beliefs uh, to find someone to discriminate against and, and, and express good, strong Christian hate. Um, for. Well, I, I have to say that uh, I, I kind of take umbrage at the word tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, I, agree. I feel that I have equal value as any other human being, and. Um, I bring as much to the table as anybody else. Uh, plus, I'm entertaining. I mean, <laughs> um, but I don't want to tolerate. I, I, I want to engage in, in a reciprocal, you know, relationship with my fellow human beings of respect. Well, you know, tolerance tolerance is uh, has a lot of different meanings, and it also it also uh, there are members of groups who have faced the tolerance. I've got I've got. Relatives who are Northern Irish Catholic who are still fighting for their civil rights, and they're using the practice of Martin Luther King still up in Northern Ireland. They moved to Chicago, and they become the biggest bigots I've ever uh, talked to. And I, I, you know, I take them to task for that. But in in any community, including LGBTQ, there are people who who um, have it, have um, discriminatory feelings against others, and I think that's something that needs to be worked on too. Oh, exactly, and that's why I said that's a big part of what we do is that we're, we're cleaning our own house inside while we're trying to work and uh, help people to understand, you know, our needs and issues and concerns. Well, my brother is, is gay, he was not saying that, uh, but he also will mention that within, within the gay male community, um, they, um, there are gradations of tolerance there, just like I have friends who are, who are of African American descent who have gradations of tolerance based on skin tone and uh, I find it so odd uh, it seems to be a human trait that we always want to find somebody that we can um, that we can have a, a negative feeling to. Uh, you could strip us all down to our underwear and then we'd fight over what kind of underwear. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean it, it, it's, it seems to be an inherent human uh, frailty that we have to one-up somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And of course in the atheist community we have we have issues that way too. I mean, atheist. You have atheist, agnostic, you have spiritual, but but not religious. And you have humanist. Yes, yeah, free thinkers. And the brights. <laughs> you have all the whole bright thing going on. So we have our own little. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I 
was thinking about is um, inside of DISC, my program, we're all so fluid and all over the place. There's a lot of gender non-conforming DISC members, including myself, I fall under the trans umbrella um, as gender non-conforming youth. Um, and a lot of my friends do as well, my best friend does as well um, as a trans youth. And um, then whenever we leave, like to go to Pride or something, I get, or when I see my uncles, I ha have this overwhelming feeling of just like these, these little sex of individuals. And I'm not used to that because I'm used to everyone being so accepting and then I go out into my own community and they're ignoring me because I'm friends with the trans youth or I am trans I think it's kind of remarkable that, I mean, I spent, I spent uh, some time this summer um, on a camping trip with um, some of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Name This kids. I think it's remarkable about, at a younger, at even younger age, they're having to make more adult decisions. Adult decisions that they would have, you know, they have to make more decisions about, you know, about protecting themselves and about, you know, to, um, to try and you know, to try and to um, to change their worlds in some ways, and and that I think, and at the same time, we're looking at them and we're wondering sometimes, like, is this a phase, or you know, when is this going to be a point when you know these are kids who are making adult decisions uh, and making the decisions. They know everything about themselves in some ways, and yet sometimes we're not willing to listen and. Uh, and we're willing to dismiss them because of how old they are. And I think it's it's remarkable how fast they have to grow up. And I think it's a shame that you know that you know that they've had to give up some of their childhood in order to you know to stand up and be more adult about themselves. You know, they've had to educate their parents in some ways. But hey, this is who I am. And this is how this is what's important to me. And uh, I think sometimes that's kind of that's kind of lost is that uh, you know they need safe places because in some ways it's still you know it's not like they wanted to give up you know they wanted to be more adult they wanted to come up and stand for themselves it's not like they, they wanted to to be to not be children anymore you know they want to have those places they want to have fun they want to be themselves you know they want to stand up for themselves I think that sometimes uh, we don't see that we don't listen I think that you need have somebody at school that you can go <coughs> to when you are bullied, that you can that safe. Might qualify that and will bring it to that you're you're starting homeschool. Yes, um, I've recently, um, as of last week, transferred out of my school okay. due to doing the bullying. Due to bullying, um, at my middle school, I did have my counselor. I went to talk to her some, quite a bit um, in my last year of school there. Um, she had been married to a man who came out as gay, Catholic, and so through that she learned about the LGBT community. And my shoes got to know my mother, who is the current president of P Flag. And um, at Central, I didn't have anybody. I didn't know anybody else knew there. What about high school did you go to? Um, Central. Central. Uh, is there not a group there? Um, there is. It's not very active oh. at all. Um, we have we, they had meetings once a month, but only a couple of kids showed up, and it wasn't. And the teachers had other things to do. I have a friend who, who headed that group a few years back, and, and he so said the biggest opposition that he had was from, from black Baptist teachers. Yes. They're the one who wants to see the groups and oppose it. You might mention your difficulty you actually had with teachers. Um, yes. Um, at my middle school, in my eighth grade year, I had a teacher who was um, a black Baptist woman, and she would come straight forward, and if there were two guys that would be conversing together about something that was off topic, she would come at them, calling them gay, and trying to get them to stop, and feel like, are they cuddling and stuff, trying to stop, and she um, simply told us she was actually talking about my best friend that came to visit her, who is transgender, and how she refused to talk to him when he came to visit her, and I 
that happen almost every single class period at that school. There was a law, so maybe you can, I don't remember the details, what was it in, a few years back there was a law student where a, a, a student came out here when he was out at his school. Jacksonville. Was it Jacksonville? Yeah, the, the okay. principal was making him read the Bible and out of yeah. his family. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, that, that school now has a GSA, and that family sued, and that boy got a nice little chunk of change, and left Arkansas. Is there any plans to go to these schools or try to do any education or meet with that teacher? We um, we work with when the families invite us to go in. And, you know, we can't because we hear these things. We can't just go charging in. Right. Although, oh, some days I just want to bite the table. Um, so where we are invited, we do go and, and uh, work with the schools. And in fact, we did have some of our staff working uh, with Xavier's family on the uh, with Pulaski, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a long process. You know, sometimes we can't fix it in two or three meetings. Um, you know, our hope is that we continue to have impact and that we continue to empower the youth that are physically in these schools and to make sure that their GSAs are strong and functioning so that it does make it uh, bearable for them to stay in the school district. Um, it breaks my heart any time a child has to leave school because mm -hmm. they're missing an important part about, about, about their youth. I <coughs> was institutionalized when I was 13. Um, and I tell you, it, some of the experiences that we've had, if we didn't go straight after that, you know, how, <coughs> how could you not know that, that it is inherently who we are? And I was put in a state mental institution at the age of 13 in the state of Florida. And uh, I was in and out of there for two years because they would always let me leave conditionally, which meant that my family had the power over me and if, if I was not behaving appropriately, and uh, from the time I was born, I didn't want to wear dresses and have my hair up and curlers. I mean, it was, it was, I didn't want to be a guy either. I was just me. But um, we had great struggles around my presentation and, and identity. And, and then I was put to Christian Girls School, uh, the Lester Roboff Schools in uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, which were on 60 Minutes because they were incredibly abusive. Um, my first act of activism was smuggling out uh, a roll of film with pictures of the beatings and uh, the results of the beatings that uh, culminated in a state attorney's investigation. And we can thank George W. Bush that they got reopened because Bush was on the education thing there and helped them get the leeway they needed to not be certified but still uh, function. And uh, so seeing some terrible things that, that happened and the deprivation of, you know, I didn't get prom. I didn't get to date uh, another kid in school and, and know what that means as you, because that's where you develop your future relationship, you know, how you're gonna interact with the person that you eventually move in together and, and live with and have a relationship with. And a lot of LGBTQ kids don't get that experience because they're pushed out of the schools, you know, either because of the bullying or, you know, uh, the administrators or, or whatever's happening to push them out. Or their families, you know, when you get thrown out of your home, how do you go to school? You know, when you're trying to figure out where you're going to sleep at night. So when families throw their kids out of school, I mean, out of the house, it means that oftentimes their education is disrupted. So a lot of us miss all those things about um, the experiences that people take for granted that you're going to have as a, as a young person growing up and going to school and going to prom and having your graduation and you know, that cadre of friends that you form and going off to college. You know, we don't get that. A lot of us don't, which is why we fight so hard to make sure that every child does get that as we're able to facilitate that. And, um, I was just gonna say as a group, we're kind of seeing the same thing with students that come out as atheists in high school. They, they experience some of the same things and uh, it is very heartbreaking and I, I don't know I wish I knew what to do, and if, can you tell us what, what could we do? Other than dress like ninjas and go. Because <laughs> Randy and I would do that. I think having spaces is a big thing. 
I think we all have to have the have the dialogue to have that. I mean, I didn't have a GSA or anything when I was going through school. I had to find other things that would be related to that. I mean, I ended up being, my my GSA was my drama club. I was a part of while I was in, in high school. Yeah. There was enough people who were like me there. But I think identifying those, maybe a teacher talking to or talking to a counselor says like, you know what? I kind of like to have this kind of group. I mean, I was able. To, I. I went, to a, I went to a Catholic high school. And I know that whenever I brought up anything about um, being gay, as I identified it part of my life through, through, through high school, that they would not touch that. I know it would be the same kind of deal with atheists. I don't think that you'd ever see an atheist group form at, at a high school. But um, I think there are other groups that might lend to that where they might be not necessarily, not necessarily religious. Yeah, maybe they need to join the GSA. Jesus, well, they do have nice. secular student alliances now in high school. Well, that's good. Yes. They are starting yeah. to read that. Um, they should be um, allowed to form a group as long as they aren't exclusive to anyone. Um, they would be allowed, because there are Christian groups in high school and, if, and other religious groups in high school, they should be allowed to join and form group. It's, not to a lot of the schools stop that though by saying that you have to have a uh, sponsor so have have a in the school and there's no teacher willing to be a sponsor of a GSA. Well, we or we a see the educators team. getting bullied. Yeah, yes. that are right, willing exactly. to stand up and be sponsors for GSAs. And uh, but, I, but I had an incident that's actually the opposite up in Jonesboro. Uh, one of the members of the newly formed car chapter up there, she's a straight ally and she's a teacher, and she said, I know I have all these gay kids in the school. I want to start a GSA form, but you know I can't go and say, "Hey, are you gay? You want to start a club?" <laughs> <laughs> right. so I, she's exactly. like, "That might be creepy." <laughs> I said it would be. I said, "But here's some things that you can do. You know, you can put up a, a no bullying sign, but make sure it's rainbow. You know, you can stand up in your class and say, if you are being bullied or you feel, you know, ostracized, etc., you can come and talk to me." I said, I guarantee you some little rainbow queerblings are going to pop out. Oh, that's what we call the kids. That's what they call themselves, the queerblings. <laughs> um, but we do see instances where people really want to provide that, and I imagine that would be very true with, with this particular type of club, that they're afraid of being bullied and ostracized. And well, just recently in Tennessee, it came out just this past week where a teacher actually was transferred to another school first for supporting a gay well a uh, atheist student and second was for supporting a gay student and all he in his supporting of them was listening to them mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how he was supporting them and so they transferred him from the school well the personal values that you, again that's that thing of the cultures that were brought, brought up in and that translates to our educators and administrators you know they're bringing those personal cultural values and while they should park them when they leave their car in the parking lot, they very often don't. And I, and I think that's something that is really incumbent upon us in the work that we do. And that's one of the things that we stress over and over and over in our trainings is that, you know, we respect that you may have different value systems when it comes to religious beliefs, but your job is to educate and provide for the safety of every student in your class. And uh, you don't get to pick and choose based on your personal religious belief system. And like I said, we try to do it with empathy, but if they don't get there, we're going to tell them about what, how much the lawsuits are going to cost them. And we make it very clear to them that we will facilitate those lawsuits. You know, we have a, a school um, in Little Rock uh, Special School District that is being very, the principal is being very, very uh, oppositional to the GSA. You know, she finally relented and allowed the GSA to form because we finally called the ACLU on her. And we're not a group that has to call the hotline and leave a message. We have the inside number because the ACLU <laughs> is so dedicated to making sure that these school cases are attended to immediately. And we help them out because we do the legwork and we get everything together and they just have to do the drop the hammer piece. So it works real well for all of us. And so the ACLU is now involved with this one particular school. And, and I believe that this principal is going to push it to the we're going to sue you point before she drops her resistance. But I know that she's very aware that it will, it will result in a lawsuit if she doesn't stop. 
and, and I think that she's smart enough to know she wants to keep her job and doesn't want to pay a big fine. But uh, she's pushing it as far as she can take it before. You know, I guess with her particular belief system, I had to do everything I could before I let the gays take over. <laughs> yeah, you know, but we're going to take over anyway. Well, that, that's an Arkansas attitude. We went through the same thing with the winter solstice display. But what I was going to get you to tell, too, is you were telling me about an event that y'all have coming up. Tell us about some things that you have coming up that we could help with. or uh, Oh, we have, a, we have a really big event coming up. Uh, James Lacine, who is an Academy Award winning actor, author, uh, and the founder of the Trevor Project, which is a national uh, hotline and crisis uh, management organization for LGBTQ youth. It's like if you're out in BFE of Arkansas and you can't find me or Kat or, you know, which any one of us are working with you as a youth, or you don't know about us, you can call the Trevor Line and they will talk to you, they will help you through it, and they will tell you that we exist and to come to CAR and come to DISC. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that of the six years that our program has been in effect, we have made sure that kids graduated that would not have graduated, and they've told because they tell us this. We have kids working that are now young adults that are working in every conceivable field across the United States, and some of them are able now to reach back and assist us. We had some that went to work for HP, and they helped to make sure that HP provided some funding for a LGBTQ youth conference we did called Riley. Um, and so with uh, the issues around suicide, um, Statistically, our population is at a significant risk. You know, they have studied this, they have looked at it, and it is a true thing. That because of the inordinate amount of being placed in the, in the position of having to make adult decisions while you're still getting your brain formulated. You know, because your brain's not grown up when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, but you're having to figure out how to survive in a world that has made its hostility very apparent to you. While at the same time trying to figure out how to be true to yourself, it makes you a little crazy. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Um, and there was no Trevor Project when I decided that taking my life would be the best option. And fortunately, despite my best machinations to make sure that I wasn't found, I was. So it must have been that I was supposed to move to Arkansas and be a thorn in their side. And I'm doing my utmost to live up to that. But uh, James Lacine, he made a little, he, he did a little Broadway piece, and or off-Broadway piece, and then they made it into a movie, and it was called Trevor. And it's about a young boy that decides that his best option is to take his own life. And he subsequently won an Academy Award for it, and then some other folks they found in the Trevor Project, which does this absolutely amazing work. And we promote the organization, we provide the information, because we know that we can't be all things to every single youth in the state of Arkansas. So we have to find every resource that we can to supplement the work that we do. And so in the process of um, my granddaughter is now uh, 20 years old, but when she was 14, she founded the GSA at Central High School with a teacher there named Lynn Smith. And, and Lynn was nervous. He didn't want to do it. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get blowback on this. And, and Devin just held him up and said, you're a gay man. You've grown up in this world. You know what this means to us. You know, and, and Lynn was like, you're right, and he took it on, and he did a fantastic job with them. He's at Parkview now, and I believe he's the GSA at Park Bay, yes. Parkview. And uh, at the time, we were dealing with the anti-adoption and foster care stuff with Jerry Cox, and that was in the legislature at that particular time. And uh, my daughter has a chronic illness that we never really know when we're going to get that call, and sometimes are worse than others. And this particular time, she was here visiting with us and wound up in. Uh, ICU at the hospital and we were set to testify on you know why this wasn't a good thing to keep us from being able to adopt our family members because my daughter's wish and my granddaughter's wish were that I adopt her if something happened and I basically raised my granddaughter most of her life so this seemed very normal to us but Jerry Cox did not want to allow us to do that and so you know I, I told my daughter I said and my granddaughter was like, you know, I understand that this isn't a good time for you to go and testify. You know, it's very upsetting that mom might not make it. And she was like, no, more than ever, this is why I have to go and testify. And so as a result of her work with that, being a founding member of DISC, 
and founding the GSA and standing up there on multiple occasions with things that were going on in school. Uh, she was awarded the Colin Higgins Youth Courage Award. And Colin Higgins was a gay man that did uh, an old movie called Harold and Maude, which is still my absolute favorite movie on the planet. Uh, he did uh, Best Little Whorehouse. Uh, he, he did a lot of, of the old 80s movies. Uh, and uh, when he passed, he left a pretty significant fund of money, and he set up a foundation that funds progressive organizations. And he also left money for this Queer Youth of Courage Fund, that um, youth that had exemplified courage in environments that were fairly hostile at Arkansas. You know, for a 14-year-old, that's, that's not a you know, welcoming place to, to bring up the issues that you do. So in the process of winning this award, she met James Lassane, who founded the Trevor Project, which hosted the big soiree where she was given her award. And it was in New York City, and it was pretty cool. And we didn't know who James Lassane was at the time. We had no idea. Who, we knew about Trevor Project, but we didn't know about James Lassane. And so anyway, they formed this friendship that has lasted over the years. We were kind of, we are always struggling to keep the doors open and to keep staff. And uh, I said, baby girl, there comes a time when we have to, you know, look who is among our friends and circle and figure out how they might be beneficial in helping us to, to upgrade our funding picture. She goes, Nana, he's my friend. I couldn't possibly. I said, well, I know he's your friend. I said, but, but think about it. So she came back a little bit later and she's like, it's the right thing to do. And the work that he does, I think that he would support us. So long story short, uh, she sent him an email. In about eight minutes, he came back and said, absolutely. And he's going, and September is National Suicide Prevention Month. So because he cares about the future and the well-being of LGBTQ youth, uh, sometimes the only way you can get other people interested in, I mean, you would think it's a no-brainer. We're, we're saving kids' lives. We're working for advocacy of, of inclusion and equal rights for LGBTQ Arkansans. You'd think that'd be a no-brainer that people would want to support that. But sometimes you've got to do the dog and pony show. And James like, I will be your pony. <laughs> I will come out so people can meet me. Are y'all participating in the Out of the Darkness Walk? Yes, we're, we're having conversations now about who's going to participate in that. Oh. Yeah, we're, we're very aware of that. So James has agreed to come at his expense, uh, his flight, his hotel, everything. He is donating that as well as his time. to, uh, to And not only is he doing a big soiree for the adult funders to come in, <laughs> and you know, get their, their feel good on about why they want to give us a check. He is also giving us one evening prior to that that is specifically for the youth and young adults. Because we know that the adults will kind of suck the air out of the room and the kids might not necessarily get a chance to have a really one-on-one -on -one conversation and to really have an experience with somebody who has gone through a lot of what they're going through, who is you know, working to help make sure that their lives are safer and um, who really wants to talk to them and work with them. So he said, well, well, given that that's probably, you're right, that's, that's usually how it goes, and given that you have this large adult uh, com um, youth community that you work with, I would absolutely love to give them their own evening. So the night before, he is hosting an event that is strictly for 13 to 22 years old. And unless you're staff, you can't get in. And, and we think that's phenomenal, that he's not only willing to help us raise money, to, to keep our doors open, but that he really wants to give this personal piece that these young people can identify with a mentor and somebody who has a modicum of success and says, you know, no matter how hard it is right now, because there's this It Gets Better campaign that tells kids, just tough it out and it'll get better in, you know, five or six years. And our response to that is, for some of us, yes, but for some of us, what about right now? And that's Carr's approach, is we're dealing with the right now. And, and a, this kid looked at me one day and said, yeah, it gets better, that's cool. But y'all are my step to the right now. And, and it really embodied how we feel about the work that we do. So this event is taking place on September the 29th. It's going to be at the First Presbyterian Church. And uh, there are sponsorship levels where there's tables available. And then individual tickets are $25 and couples serve to $45. And, and we think it's going to be a really phenomenal event. And he's going to do a actor studio sort of thing where Devin, because she is his personal friend, is going to interview him. And then uh, we're going to show the film Trevor. And then the disc, a lot of our disc kids are going to be there. 
you know, working the event because they had fun the night before. And then they're going to do a, a little conversation with the audience. And then James is going to wrap it up because he has a new book out that he's co-edited, uh, the, the Letters Q. And it's uh, LGBTQ authors writing letters to themselves about, you know, their perspective, where they are and where they've been. And then he'll have some of his other books available as well. So it's, it's going to be a great evening. Uh, one of our sponsors has uh, hired a live band because he just thought that would be the thing to do. <laughs> and they've got floors to don't. I mean, these, these, these gentlemen have just real, I call them the Kyle Squared because it's Kyle Hoffman and Kyle Boswell from Boswell and the Road Galleries. And they are just like, we are in it with you. We are going to give you everything we can to make this the most premier event. And next year, you will not be able to hold it in that church. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, interested to know when uh, some of the gay straight uh, uh, alliances where you have both straight people and people with their uh, lesbian, gay, bi, or transsexual in the schools. Uh, how successful have you been in getting straight kids? Participate in that. Ones that are supportive of uh, rights for uh, you know people of different gender. It's pretty organic. Lives. I mean, uh, we don't really have to facilitate their participation. I mean, you know, some straight kids just know fabulous when they see it. Okay. <laughs> um, we um, at GSAs. Um, um, I'm just giving myself a disc in my experience with the support GSA. Um, we don't really ask, so we don't really know who's straight and who's not. We just, we don't really care as long as you're there, you're there. It's cool, you're there, you're fabulous. Just be there. Um, so that's the thing. It's pretty confidential when we get into that kind of stuff. And, and a lot of kids, they may have uh, a friend that identifies as LGBTQ, but they don't. But they, they really, and their friend will go, man, this program is so cool. Why don't you come over here and check it out? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, we know because we do an intake form. Because we conduct this in a very professional and uh, a manner that makes sure that we're accountable to the levels. Because we don't want any kind of blowback that, you know, we think of all the worst case scenarios. And we structure ourselves to be so accountable that we don't get caught like that. And, uh, so we do an intake form that, that does ask. So I think a lot of the success of that is going to be not just being able to organize uh, the gay community in the general sense or whatever, uh, but also making it accepted by the straight community. Which is why we're part of the Arkansas Citizens First Congress. Yes. Yeah. You know, out of those 54 groups, there's only two that are LGBTQ. Right. And this last Congress convening, we took, how many kids did we take? Um, Anyhow, we, we took a bunch of our youth, including Xavier, and uh, previously the only youth that had ever been in attendance and not in a, in a structured way had been uh, primarily African American youth from the Delta. And this year we really put a bug in that, you know, if we're going to talk about uh, making a better Arkansas for our Kansans, that includes our youth and young adults. And that if we're going to be who we say in Congress, that we should have their voices represented in a much more intentional way. So we wound up with uh, a lot of Latino youth, uh, LGBTQ youth, and, and our LGBTQ youth run across the, the spectrum of race, ethnic, you know, the whole thing. And then uh, African American youth from the Delta, and, and they were working across the board on education. And so this gives them room to talk about how African American youth are being pushed into that prison pipeline, school to prison pipeline, and it was a, a place for LGBTQ people to talk about well, how that also impacts them, and how a lot of the policy stuff and the Latino youth, particularly if you're perceived to be undocumented, you know, that's a whole ball of wax right there. And so, you know, their, their commonality was that despite their identifiers, they were experiencing prejudice in the school system that was uh, hampering their ability to get a quality education. So we get that, absolutely. And we do work across the board, which is why I'm sitting here on my Sunday afternoon <laughs> talking to free thinkers. <laughs> I have a question for Latricia 
and it, we have, believe it or not, this is a really white crowd, but we do have black Did members. You <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering, it, it's probably, um, I hear from them that they have even a more difficult time than we do in our ultra-Christian communities um, coming out as atheists. So I'm wondering if that applies to the homosexuality issue as well. Believe it or not, I know a lot of uh, I know a lot of black gay people who go kind of my route, go more spiritual. We don't really go to church. We don't really, you know, nitpick. Okay, we're going to follow this rule. We see a, a higher power. But then I have um, some gay people, some gay friends who are in church every Sunday still. You know, they have a, a couple of churches that are are mostly black and they are very accepting but it's not very many it's only one that comes to mind right now and they have church on sunday night and the black gay community is there on sunday night i don't know if it's really that they don't want us there in the daytime but they get they get what they need there on sunday night um yeah it's a it's kind of one of those things is personally what you can tolerate I can't tolerate just going to church just because, you know, I think I'm supposed to if I know that I'm, just me being there is going against everything that I believe in. And there's still a lot of people who who tolerate going to church and knowing that these people don't, you know, look at them as, they look at them as less than or they look at them as sinners or evil, but they go because of their faith. And I have, you know, respect for that. And, to a certain degree, but it's just not my preference. And, and I would I would say to, to piggyback on that as a Latina, uh, coming from a community that is often uber religious as well, um, and being with a lot of African American very very close friends, um, my perception is that coming from my community and then seeing what I've seen, um, that. As a people that in, in places of very dire oppression, that faith was the only place they had to go to, to feel safe, to feel protected. And uh, so it, it, I think it does contribute to a, 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 a style of thinking that even though it may not necessarily be good for you, because when we look at, at how African Americans became Christians, you know, that's a horrific history. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're such uh, historically illiterate people anyway. We wouldn't have half the problems we have if we just pay attention to our history. Um, and the same thing with, the, I speak from a Mexican, uh, <coughs> you know, what the priests did going into Mexico to, to bring people to, to Christianity was horrific. Uh, but yet, they will now beat me with that same Bible that they were burning them at the stake to, to make them become. Because at that time, the Inquisition was in full blast and they were implementing much of that behavior with the indigenous population of Mexico to, to bring them to Christianity. And so it, it never ceases to amaze me that groups of people that have been, you know, uh, really subjected to horrific treatment that has included torture, rape, and murder that have now embraced this so, so tightly and then turn it against other people, which shows you how well internalized oppression works, which shows you how well the whole thing is working to keep people in line. Because we keep going against our best interest, you know, based on a system of values that we're used to, to get us in line. And so, That's yeah. why I can appreciate a free thinker, because I know people who, who even though they know in their heart of hearts they were born this way and, you know, nothing nothing can or will change that, they still go into these places and say, you're evil, you're sick, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to, it's so deep in them, their religious faith. And I think in the, in the same way, uh, their religion kind of got them through like maybe bullying or things like that. It was kind of hypocritical to me, that's why. Yeah, kind of. What you're describing, man, sounds to me almost like a, cultural Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. And to a degree, I, I would say that's correct. Um, and, and the fact that we don't have our history taught in the context of its actual uh, 
events. Well, we have know. a victor's history. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and whoever wins writes a history book. Right. You know, uh, we have over in Texas, it's the largest purchaser of textbooks in the nation and has willfully and wantonly just recently obliterated some of people of color's history out of their textbooks. And because tex Texas uh, purchases the largest amount of textbooks, those are the books that are going to be printed that the rest of the nation buys. Mm -hmm. And so this has a profound impact on what we're learning. The rewriting history. Recreating history, I don't know if that's what I call it, but um, <clears throat> I guess we need to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, but does anybody have any more questions or anything? I just and want to thank you all. I know. I, yeah, I, I, oh. That was what I was going to say, how brave especially Xavier. I mean, all of you are great, but uh, in high school and to have to, to face that. So I really do appreciate it's all It's hard that. at any age, but the younger you yeah. are, the harder it is. But again, too, the younger you are when you come out, the, I think the, I'm kind of jealous <laughs> that, <laughs> that the better you'll do as an adult. The longer I think that, your life you normalcy have, And you have this wonderful support. And, 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 let, and let me say, I know that I talked a lot. Um, <laughs> I own it, <laughs> but these guys, this is the first time that we have done this together, and oh, wow. so we're in the learning process of, of speaking and representing and sharing, and I fully anticipate them to shut me up and talk to paint off the house because, you know, we want to grow people in our organization that it is all of us, and at various levels we have other people that can speak to this in the way that I do, but these guys are, are like in training. And so I just want you to, to understand that I know that I talked a lot, but I know these guys, and I'm so grateful that they've come and given their time and energy to, to share their experiences, but also to learn more about how we do what we do and to share it with you. And I guarantee you the next time you see one of them somewhere, they, just, <laughs> well, no, <laughs> they got this. <laughs> I was gonna say, I hope y'all come back next year and we can do this again and uh, Randy won't talk. <laughs> I'll stay home and watch football. Yeah. You know, I'll let the young folk carry it. Yeah. So anyway, but thank you. I do we all really appreciate it. Thank you.